Good afternoon. So there are many diseases that affect males and females differently and at different rates. And some of this is due to genetic differences. As you all know, males only have one X chromosome, whether, whereas females have two. So if a male is carrying an X-linked disease-causing variant, there's no second allele to potentially rescue it, whereas in females, there is. However, females are also affected by X-linked diseases. For instance, we heard about uh, fragile X syndrome just before. And there's an increased variability in, in the phenotypes uh, in females. And to understand this, you've got to remember that in any one cell, there's only one X active at a time. So through a process called the X chromosome inactivation, one of the two Xs gets condensed into this little red dot that's called the, the bar body with very different uh, epigenetics. And so it's got different 3D structure, different histones, different histone marks, and crucially, different DNA methylation. X chromosome inactivation takes place early in development. It is a stochastic process, so you might have either of the two Xs uh, uh, undergoing inactivation. And so what you end up with is a mosaic pattern. So if you could label your cells by the, the X they have active, as, as red or, um, or green, you'd have a mix of red and green cells. And you can see that in the coat uh, color of cats with patches of red fur and black fur. So you've got to remember that females are mosaics and take that into account. But it's not always 50-50 green and, and, and red. Um, in, in fact, you can have skewed inactivation. And this could be regional, so it could be patches of, of coat uh, for, for cats, or it could be tissue specific, maybe the brain is skewed one way and the rest of the organism isn't, or it can be global. So there's only a few cells uh, when uh, X inactivation first occurs, and so by chance you can have all those cells making the same decision and you end up with only red cells, for instance. And if the X uh, that's preferentially active carries uh, a disease-causing mutation, then you can uh, assume that it will impact the phenotype of, of the patient. So the question is, can we determine skewed X inactivation? And I'll show you that by looking at DNA methylation in long reads, we can. So we make use of the fact that when you sequence native DNA, you get uh, the methylation. And so you can look uh, without any parental data for um, skews in inactivation and at the same time detect uh, putative uh, risk variants. So we apply this to a cohort of, uh, of patients in collaboration with clinicians from Melbourne Uni, and uh, they're interested in inherited retinal disorders. So the retina is a complex tissue, there's lots of different cell types, and lots of things can go wrong. But crucially, uh, if you intervene early with gene therapy or stem cell therapy, you can prevent the loss of vision. And we still don't understand very well how female, pa female patients are impacted by those X-linked uh, mutations. Um, but if you, if you can intervene early, maybe, maybe you can prevent uh, loss of vision. So the, the big problem is that we don't routinely have access to retinas. Um, so instead, we have to sample peripheral tissues. And so we look at blood, saliva, and buccal swab, and then extrapolate to what might be happening in the retina. So our workflow is very simple. We get all these tissues, extract some DNA, put it under the promethion, we've got a P24, and we do adaptive sampling to enrich for X chromosome reads. We aim for 10 to 20 KB reads, uh, and we aim for about 20 X coverage per tissue. And I really love adaptive sampling. Uh, without any f further lab work, you can get three to four-fold enrichment, so that's great. But you have to be really careful with the sizing of your sample. So on the tape station plot uh, on the top, you can see there's some shorter reads. They don't look like much like this, but they will ruin your uh, enrichment efficiency if you, if you put that on the flow cell. So we, we're really careful with this. But when it works, it works really nicely. So from one promethion, we can get about 90x coverage, which, let, which lets us run uh, four samples at a time on that flow cell. And you can see on chromosome X, we hit the 20x coverage. And on chromosome 1, you nicely deplete, and you get about 2x. Our bioinformatics pipeline is composed of five steps. First, uh, you base call. Second, you call variants. 
Third, you phase those variants, and then you look at your reads and look at their methylation pattern, and you, you uh, cluster them, and you usually end up with a cluster of highly methylated reads and lowly methylated reads, and then you can tally this up with the haplotype information to calculate the skew. So to give you a feel for the data, here's what the, the haplotype uh, reads look like. And you can see that we can't phase the whole chromosomes. Instead, the phasing is broken up in regions of low SNP density, so we get those haplotype blocks. And so if uh, in block N, the maternal allele is haplotype 1, maybe the maternal allele is haplotype 2 in the following block, so you've got to keep that in mind. But what we do next is we look at reads that overlap CPG islands. And so on the left, uh, they're all, you know, that's all the reads that map there. But you can see there's really two patterns. There's one highly methylated set of reads, and we assign those to the inactive X. Um, and there's a set of lowly methylated reads on that CPG island, and that's the active X. So we do this clustering with nanometh viz. And now for each read, we know which haplotype it comes from, and we know which X it comes from. So then it's just a matter of counting things up. And the nice thing is, if your haplotype block actually covers multiple CPG islands, you can pull that information because it's the same haplotype one at all the CPG islands. So if you've got 20x coverage overall, but you've got five CPG islands on that block, you actually have 100x coverage to calculate the skew. So you count how many times you find the haplotype 1 as active, and then for each block you get a skew. And then it's just a matter of uh, calculating the maximum likelihood estimate for the, the skew overall in the sample, and you can get very, very, very accurate uh, estimates because you've got hundreds of blocks and they can overlap multiple CPG islands. So what do we find? Well, we find some patients that have quite strong skews. So uh, in the red patient here is not particularly skewed, but the green and blue ones are. And you can see that there's really good concordance between tissues. So each dot is a haplotype. And so, for instance, on the bottom left here, maybe the haplotype 1 was always the inactive one. And you can see that if it was inactive in the blood, it's inactive in the saliva. So that tells you it's not a tissue-specific skew. It's actually the whole organism uh, that, that's skewed. And that skew may be either beneficial or deleterious, depending on which allele is affected. So in this patient, we could find a, hap a frame shift mutation on haplotype 2 in a gene important for, retinal, uh, for, for the retina. And unfortunately, haplotype 2 was the one that was preferentially activated in those cells, so you might predict that that contributes to the severe phenotype of this patient. So in conclusion, I want you to always remember that females are mosaic and take that into account when you look at the link between genotype and phenotype. And one way to do this is to calculate X inactivation skew. And today I've shown you a method to, to do this with long native DNA reads. So we use this to better understand how females are affected by retinal diseases. But what I'm excited about is that it's really applicable to all X-linked diseases and indeed all X-linked risk variants. So if you calculate polygenic risk scores, you might want to take into account skewed X inactivation as well. So I would expect it to, uh, this method to become you know, rolled out into the, the um, routine long-read genomics uh, pipelines for humans. So lastly, I'd like to thank the Blewett and Ritchie labs at WeHi, our collaborators at the University of Melbourne, and our patients and funders. Thank you for your attention.